Jake Tucker, what is your favourite game? My favourite game is XCOM. With a hyphen, let's say. With a hyphen. With a hyphen. <laughs> <laughs> So there wasn't really much to do. I grew up in, uh, I grew up basically out in the country, and there was just kind of council estates and nothing much else. So I got a master system when I was really young. Started playing things like Alex the Kid and stuff like that. Mm. Um, that went onto a Mega Drive, but I didn't really buy into games properly until I got a PlayStation and started kind of running around and playing games on that. Like, like what, what games were you playing then at that time for the PlayStation? Oh yeah, I mean, um, Road Rash was the game I got with my with my PlayStation. I used to play that all of the time. Um, Worms, Metal Gear Solid, um, Armored Core, all you know, kind of all, loads of games that you don't see much of anymore. Wow, like that's proper late '90s stuff. All the PS1 was late '90s. And it was, um, like, what what were those kind of experiences like back then? Like playing those? Um, it was something else. I mean, uh, you, people had come from. So you've got to bear in mind like the generation now went from kind of like Mega Drive to PlayStation, which, which is just such a gigantic, massive... So you went from playing like Streets of Rage 2, which is a fantastic game, um, but all the way up to the graphical fidelity and playing games like Fighting Force, which arguably was a worse game. <laughs> but it was kind of in a big... It was suddenly like a big 3D environment and cutscenes existed, and it was, it was just such a large step forward. I mean, I remember... One of the first games that I played on the PlayStation was uh, Legacy of Kane, Blood Omen. Mm, yeah. And that was such a massive step up over everything that I'd played before at that point on, on a console. I, I've, 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 I've never played a Legacy of Kane. I, I only knew of it because of Crystal Dynamics and, yes. and Amy Hennig's involvement, and Amy Hennig being like one of my favourite developers. So I, I've never played um, any of the Legacy of Kane stuff, but I've been... I've been I've uh, been meaning to you know check them out like for a long time and like Crystal Dynamics were apparently working on a Legacy of Kane game like really long ago with uh, with Climax they they were making one as well an episodic game of, of I think it was episodic and it was for PS3 and Xbox 360 but it was canned a few years ago I want to see if, I want to check out if that's true so wait. Check this out. Uh, Legacy of Cain. Da, 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 da. There we go. Legacy of Cain, Dead Sun. That's it. And it was in development with Climax as supervision from Crystal Dynamics. Yeah. Looks really looked really cool. Huh. Um. So you were playing other games at that time, like? Well, I mean, yeah. While while I was kind of playing these PlayStation, while I was, while I was playing these games on the PlayStation, I was also getting really heavily into kind of strategy games on the PC. Um, so I was playing a lot of uh, playing a lot of Jagged Alliance 2 and XCOM and Command and Conquer and stuff like that. Mm, like uh, Command and Conquer was like like just celebrated its 20th anniversary. So like um, it's really interesting to go back through that with a fresh pair of eyes. I would I would like to thank. Um, so um, like what what was the experience like with um, Command and Conquer back then? Like, cause were you playing that before or after uh, playing the first XCOM? Um, probably a little bit before. Um, I didn't really, so XCOM came out in like 1994, but I didn't play it until 1999. Mm. Um, so I was probably playing Command and Conquer about the same time. I was nine, so my recollection's a little bit fuzzy. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I was, I was, I think I played Command and Conquer first, and my experience of it was pretty positive. I mean, um, Obviously, now you know that it's just kind of rock, paper, you know, like, now you know it's rock, paper, scissors, it's not quite the same, but back then it really felt exciting. Um, I used to be really into the moment when you kind of, like, broke the enemy and you destroyed something that they couldn't buy back, so, like, in Command and Conquer, when you are fighting against an enemy in the missions, um, they couldn't build, like, a new construction centre, and once your construction centre's dead, you can't build anything else. 
So from there, it's like slow attrition. And I remember I'd send big attacks into the enemy base just to kill that construction center, because from there, it was just a slow spiral down with everything you killed they couldn't rebuild. And I just remember getting incredibly into that as a kid. Well, we'll touch upon more strategy routes um, around uh, when we get in the XCOM. But um, like further down the line, like after you know the PS1 era, like and uh, the Sega era, like so to speak, after well, cause by that point Sega had, uh, had gotten out of the hardware business. Like there was obviously PS2 and all that there. Like I would assume you you would have been part of that experience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I went on. Um, I. I got a PS2 fairly soon after launch um, because I remember playing Red Faction and I was basically the only kid on my street to have a PS2 so everyone wanted to be my friend. Um, But yeah, I played a lot of Red Faction I played a lot of the launch PS2 titles and obviously there was Time Splitters a lot of shooting games, to be honest, in that in that era. Mm, like like you've uh, like you've written before, and we'll, we'll talk about how you got into the industry proper. But like you've written before about time splitters, um, and how and how that's helped you um, at uni. So like, um, it's 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 time splitters. Like I I I played a bit of the first game, like quite a bit, and I didn't really get into it. But time splitters two, I definitely could. It was such a fantastic game for its time. Like one of the best shooters ever. Easily, and you've met, like like I said, you said it before. Your love of time splitters. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. I feel the same about Goldeneye as well. So I feel like there was just this kind of golden point, as it were, where um, Rare are kind of in and making all of these fantastic games. Because a lot of uh, a lot of the Rare guys, like David Doak, went on to work on Time Splitters, didn't he? Mm, yeah, he did. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I feel like it's got a lot of the same magic as that, but it's just so expansive and it's designed to be played with friends. Like every game mode, I mean, they started to move away from things that were just shooting each other, which is still fun. But you'll get game modes like uh, Flame Tag and Infection and just things that were designed to play with your friends, and that was quite nice. Um, I mean, the actual storyline. I mean, you could play it all in co-op, which is nice, but the actual storyline was pretty pants. It was all about the multiplayer. You could drop in and out of that game and you could play it as and when suited you. And I think that's what I really liked is that it was good. If you wanted to play it for six hours, that was fine. If you wanted to play it for like 20 minutes before running out the door, that was okay as well. Um, I like the weapons, the characters. Like I still remember a lot of the multiplayer maps in detail in my head. <laughs> I, I, like I've never played Future Perfect, but like Time Splitters Two, like is perhaps the big defining point of that series for me, as it would be for most people. So I'd say. Um, and what what other launch titles were you playing at that time for the PS2? Like for me, it was like more or less Ridge Racer, SSX, and uh, Ready to Rumble as well. Yeah, um, Ready to Rumble was bad. <laughs> I liked Ready to Rumble. It was like it was, oh, yeah. it, was like, it was it was charmingly shit, essentially. Yeah, I think that's I think that's reasonable. Um, I played a lot of uh, Kesson. That was the strategy game for um, PS2. Didn't work fantastically, but they tried. Um, what else? I played a lot of Tekken Tag Tournament. That was quite a popular one. Yeah, SSX. Um, Smuggler's Run is a game that people don't talk about anymore and really should. Smuggler's Run is... Um, I've, have you played Smuggler's Run? Do you have I've, any I've, I've not played it, but I, have, I know of it. Okay, well, yeah, just for anyone that might not be, because it kind of sunk into obscurity. Smuggler's Run was a Rockstar game, and um, the idea was that you were a smuggler, and there was a big expanse of uh, big expanse of ground, and you just had to run around smuggling stuff. So you, what that would mean is you'd pick up a package and you'd take it somewhere else while being chased by the authorities. But it's... Considering Rockstar went on to build like gigantic worlds, like in Grand Theft Auto V, for example, it's a real shame that they've never revisited Smuggler's Run after the second one. Mm. Because they could definitely do good things with it now, and I remember playing that excessively all the time. Like, Rockstar, like, well, Rockstar open world stuff is their forte now. I don't really foresee any game that doesn't have an open world from Rockstar anymore, unless it's Max Payne, even then. That's going to be more of the rarity than it is the exception, so... Yeah. Um, like Rockstar stuff back then, the early PS2 days, was really something like compared to even now. Like if you if you look back and compare the GTA now, or sorry, not yeah, yeah GTA now compared to GTA 14 odd years ago, GTA 3, it's staggering how much uh, it's improved as a series. Um, but not not just GTA as well, but look at games like. If you, if you count last year, I don't know, it's like Midnight Club. Yeah. Um, Midnight Club 2, to be more specific. And um, the 
Midnight Club 2 through to Midnight Club, I want to say 3 or LA edition. I can't remember. What was the last Is one? it the dub edition? Is that the I last think, I think Midnight Club 3 was the last edition. I might be wrong. I might, uh, Los Angeles. That was the last no, Yeah, that was the last one. Midnight Club Los Angeles was the last one. And that was what? Six odd years ago? No, sorry. It was eight years ago. And even then, like, as an. As an open world, it's it's between Midnight Club Two and Midnight Club Los Angeles Rockstars just put out some amazing stuff. Yeah. Um, but um, I'm rambling on at this point. Um, like so, I did you first get in the industry set things basically? Yeah. Um, in terms of industry, I mean, I've I've been playing games for so many years um, <laughs> that by the time I left university, it was what I knew best. And I mean, I worked in marketing for a little while, um, just for a variety of other things like phones and tech. Um, but then I just, I mean, it sounds silly, but I just kind of decided to write about games mm. and I sent a couple of pitches and I got quite lucky and that, here I am in that sense. Um, and like this other stuff as well, but the big, big, you know, point is video brains. So like yes. for, the, for those who don't know about video brains and it, and it is something uh, people should check out, then, uh, what is video brains? Oh well, Video Brains is uh, well. I mean, Vice very happily described us as the uh, as the TED Talks of video games, um, which is nice, and I'll stick to that. <laughs> um, and that's basically us. It's, it's actually um, it's less of it's less of a conference atmosphere, and it's more kind of just an evening of talks and networking, and kind of just meeting people who are passionate about games like you are. Mm. And it's nice because it's not just an industry thing and it only costs like five pounds and you can just come along and you can see people talk about interesting game stuff and meet people who are interested in game stuff. Um, and I, I think that's quite nice. But I mean, obviously I would. I'm quite biased. Easily biased. Yeah. <laughs> um, like, with, with video, and I said this as someone who's never been because, hello, Irish Sea. But, like, <laughs> as as someone who's not been there, but I, I've I've watched the talks, like, it's, like like you say, it's it's a very intimate affair, like, so to speak, because it's not a big conference thing. It's, it's very intimate. Yeah, I mean, you're looking at an audience of about 60 people, and I could probably fill a bigger, I could probably fill a bigger space, but I, I much prefer... Yeah, I could probably fill a bigger space, but I much prefer having a smaller, smaller atmosphere like that. I mean, by watching the talks, you're getting kind of all of the knowledge part, but you're missing out on kind of the fun social atmosphere, which is kind of sixty people coming together just to chat amongst themselves, basically. Like, do you, do you want to do a bigger venue, like like for one offs type of stuff? Um, I've considered it. Um, at the moment, we're doing all day events, and I've got an all day event. Depending, well, I mean, this will probably come out after I announce it properly. Um, but we're doing an all day event on December twelfth, um, and that's going to be at Loading, which is uh, a bar in London, and that's slightly larger. Um, but like an actual big, big event, you ri- run the risk of taking it out of. Uh, you run the risk of taking it out of uh, out of the pubs, basically that it's been in. And I reckon that could change things for the worst, like in terms of the atmosphere, because atmosphere is key. I really like the fact that everyone feels like they belong there. I don't want to transport it to like a stuffy conference hall. No, 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 nothing like that. But like uh, somewhere, somewhere like a bit bigger than say Loden or Lockdown. Um, maybe, but not for a while yet. I think I quite like that. There's only sixty, seventy people that that can attend. Let's get into your favourite game then. XCOM Enemy Unknown. That's XCOM again with a hyphen just to... Hyphen XCOM. Yes. <laughs> X hyphen com. Yes. And, and uh, just to kind of put this out there, um, my experience of XCOM mainly comes from Firaxis, uh game uh, from a few years ago. So um, I- I'll probably jump in from that kind of side. Jake can handle the, uh, the X hyphen com side of things. Um, like you've mentioned your... Um, your previous experiences with strategy that come out with Command and Conquer, but like, what else were you playing at that time? Um, yeah, I mean, it was basically it was XCOM and Jagged Alliance two, mm. all the time. Um, I also played a lot of. Um, I also played a lot of. Uh, would have been about Alpha Centauri time back then. Um, like going back to that that kind of experience. Well, 
staying with strategy, but like going elsewhere from X XCOM for the um, Command and Conquer. Like, did you play any other of the spin-off series, like Red Alert or Generals? Yeah, yeah. I've I've actually I've played all of them since. Um, I've been I've been playing Active Aggression recently, which is yeah, which is the Ugen Systems alternate, I guess. Hmm. Like. I've I've wanted to play Red Alert Free a long time ago when I was on the console because I, I can't play anything on the PC anymore, which kind of makes it sad, especially considering that's all my time on XCOM and I was on the PC. So, um, but like like talk about Jagged Alliance uh, for a few months, like um, like yeah. what that was like for you. Um, yeah, J- Jagged Alliance was amazing. Jagged Alliance is, I mean, so you asked me my favourite game, and it definitely came down to kind of XCOM or Jagged Alliance, and XCOM just about scraped it. Mm. Um, Jagged Alliance is is fantastic. It's basically a game where you play as mercenaries and you go and overthrow the country. I mean, there's there is some storyline in that, like, the dictator is evil, so I guess you're supposed to feel fine about killing all these hundreds of people, but ultimately you're just overthrowing a country. In the same way in Metal Gear Five, you're just running a PMC. You know, it's um, it's interesting because it's in, it goes into incredible detail. So you get things like mortars, or you get like you get suppression, and you can get people kind of climbing up on the rooftops to put cover fire down. You get like body armor and night vision goggles, and and all of this stuff costs money. Or you do what I do, and it's just kind of scavenge it from people. <laughs> hmm. Um. So, so just to jump on the XCOM then, like, kind of like for someone who hasn't like played the the old XCOM, who's played the new XCOM, like, yeah. give, give the elevator pitch on uh, X hyphen com. <laughs> um, this, this is going to be a common theme now. X hyphen com. So yeah, right. I mean, XCOM Enemy Unknown with the uh, with the hyphen mm. X hyphen. Um, it's it's basically just bigger it's a lot more kind of the the macro scale is much larger so rather than playing as uh, rather than playing as like a SWAT team like you've got as a four man SWAT team you you're just sending like 14 men out into the darkness and the aliens are much more powerful than you are and you've got a lot you don't have all of these special abilities so it's literally just a gun in their hand and there's just so many nice so many nice tactical permutations that come into it um, so with XCOM, it's quite cinematic. There's cutscenes. There's this kind of like a lot of the systems are stripped back from the original, and so the original doesn't quite work as well, and it's not quite as um, it's not quite as succinct, I guess, a playing experience. But you can you can do so much more. So like you get to build your base, and aliens come and attack it, and they don't come and attack it. So an enemy within they attack it as like a structured mission. In this, they can just, like, you have to build your base in a way, and there are wiki guides and, like, videos and big, long written guides hidden away in the annals of the internet telling you how to build your base so the aliens come in it and get caught in your choke points. Yeah. And that's um, that's just something that you don't ever, you don't really get in games as much these days. It's something like... Like you can carry a rocket launcher, for example, and that's fantastic. But if your man gets panicked by the aliens, which happens because you know aliens are scary, um, he could panic and turn around and like fire that missile launcher directly into the open bay of your transport mm. ship and kill everyone. And it's 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 good because for a lot of XCOM, for maybe the first kind of hundred hours or so that you play the original, you are losing because you're doing the wrong things. But it's like it's a slow and interesting failure. Mm. Um, so like the way that I used to clear UFOs when I was a kid because I was nine and I didn't really understand all of the percentages and strategies is I would ha- hand one of my rookies so one of my rookies would carry around with him like a new recruit um, and I'd pick the guy with the highest speed but the worst other stats so he was a pretty useless soldier and I would just strap a debt pack to his leg and then he'd just pull it out of his inventory arm the debt pack and just run into the aliens now the aliens would kill him He'd die, drop the debt pack, and it would blow up everything in the uh, spaceship. And it was a very stupid strategy, <laughs> but, 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 it, but it's a fun story. But but it's a it's a game where like you learn from your mistakes as well. Yeah. Um, well, that's it. Is there's a really fantastic learning curve. So like the first time your base gets attacked and you haven't built it properly, and you've got aliens crawling out of every airlock and hangar everywhere all around you. Um, then you learn and you go, oh, I really don't want that to happen again. So we're going to do this. Or the first time that you send a man, like, so a man, if, if you get separated in XCOM, you die. 
Mm. That's like if one of your guys gets separated, um, you can't really see anything in the darkness around you anyway. Aliens are much more powerful than you are, often have mental powers or much more resistance to damage than you do. So if you get separated, chances are you're going to die. Mm. And I feel like that's nice because you're never told that's what will happen. What mm. happens is you move a guy a little bit too far away from safety and he gets shot and he's dead. There's no, There's no coming back from that. There's no... There's no healing, there's no, like, you know, he just gets shot and he dies and then you can come and you can pick his corpse up and that's it. That's that's all you get from him. And I, I kind of like how brutal that is. Um, and I kind of like that you have to learn these systems slowly. So you will learn how to, like, assault a barn or you'll learn how to uh, how to raid an alien spaceship. And... It's interesting because as you get better, the gear that you get is better as well. So I've got a save on my computer at the moment where I've got like, I think it works out as like 21 fully armoured soldiers armed to the teeth. And some of them have got like mind control powers. Mm. And missions happen when no one on my team even gets a scratch. No one even gets fired at, you know? Um, and it's it's nice because it encompasses that entire experience from like 14 scared squaddies running around a uh, farmyard while aliens shoot at them all the way to raiding alien bases in like big shiny flying armor mm. like you you mentioned how if soldiers got killed like like if they got shot that was them dead yeah um like that and like ha- like having those kind of characters like like you build a bond with them more or less like like I'm speaking truthfully from like XCOM for Axis XCOM experience but like even when you see a teammate like you know you've seen out in your team like a lot more often in field on the field and they die like it still rips away at you well it doesn't rip away at you but it just frustrates you in that you won't be able to use that reliable teammate again and and, and that's same that's true for any XCOM game like we Gollops uh, XCOM or or Solomon's XCOM basically like like having that, um, yeah, just basically losing that teammate is just shit. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> shit is basically the term. I mean, so the way that the way that ranking up works in XCOM, um, hyphen XCOM, is uh, so people get promoted to lead men. That's the purpose. So rather than it being a glorified leveling system, which is what it is in Solomon's XCOM, and that's fine. I'm really excited for XCOM two, and I'm really gutted about the delay. But in Gollop's XCOM. You uh, you get promoted to lead men. So basically, if you have twenty soldiers, one of them will be promoted to like captain. And if you have like a hundred soldiers, if you have like fifty soldiers, one of them will be promoted to uh, lieutenant. And if you have like a hundred, someone will be promoted to overall commander of XCOM. Now, sending your overall commander of XCOM into battle is a really good idea because it inspires people around them and it gives them extra morale buffs and things like that. Whereas if they die. Everyone freaks out. Everyone just drops their guns and starts panicking and running around all over the place. So it's interesting because they kind of mirror. So for you, you're like, oh no, this is someone that I've spent 30 hours sending on missions. Um, And it's good to see that your troops are kind of mirroring that feeling. Mm. Like they properly just drop their guns and just run off. (laughs) Like, I don't know if there's any kind of character customization, teammate customization in the UFO on them? Or? Um, you can name them, but there's no customization. Ah, okay. That's uh, okay, because all you really want is people to have the excellent guile haircut. <laughs> I mean, like, for me, in um, the Firaxis XCOM, like, like I, 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 I have um, teammates with, based on friends, I know, like, I remember um, setting my first team up uh, when I started playing the game, and I had me, the PR manager of 2K at the time, because I figured, hey, why not? You gave me the game. Um, also, Matt Reynolds of Digital Spy, Aoife Wilson of Eurogamer, and... Oh, God. I think there was one more, but... Uh, like, um, yeah, there was one more, but I can't remember who it was. And they've all died, with the exception of Aoife, as of, what, about a year ago, the last time I played the game, so... Um, yeah, I've I've... It, basically, to anyone who plays XCOM or at least the newer XCOM games, do not make your team based on friends. It just hurts. It just hurts even more. It just does. Um, um. So X hyphen com like it was more like if Firaxis was more of a faster 
game, so to speak, then X hyphen com was more of a slow and steady approach, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a little different in that, so with XCOM, you are kind of a singular, so, you know, the newer XCOM, well, this is confusing. <laughs> so, yeah, 2012 XCOM, um, you're more singular in that your purpose is to go and kill aliens. Mm. That's it. You go on missions repeatedly, and you kind of play through this narrative, and at the end of the narrative, you win. Yay! Um, whereas in the original XCOM, like, the way that you do it, is all done by research, but it doesn't tell you what research. There's no guide. There's no kind of helping hand to get you through it. So if you don't realize that that's what you're doing, what, all you're really doing is just trying to fight back the alien menace. Mm. And it is literally like they will build bases in countries and then you will have to go and raid the bases, not because you've been told you have to mm. by the game, but just because if you don't, then they're going to have way more presence in that area. Um, and you've got to deal with things like like a lot more things like logistics and sat- um, you have radar coverage over satellites, which I think is much better because you don't just build a base in like, you know, hey, Europe base. You have to actually situate it and look at where the radar is going to fall so you can put it in like the tip of Scotland, for example, or in South Africa. And, you know, it's mm. it's just got a lot more systems to it. And I feel like when games are pushing up against systems, that's when they're the most fascinating. I want to uh, touch upon the kind of um, gameplay perspective in that X-Com gives you... This is going to get tedious at some point, X-Com, <laughs> just saying it so often. Like, X-Com, like, it, playing it, like, it gives you two, you know, different ways to play. Geoscope and Battlescope. Like, we'll go into that a little bit. Yeah, so, I mean, you've got, a, you've got kind of the Battlescope there. It's basically like... Um... Like I, that's that's you fighting. It's pretty similar to it's pretty similar to the new ones kind of missions. Like it's just you. You have to first things first is so the ship lands and your first turn is you just there sat in, in the ship with no view of what's outside. And the first thing you have to do is set up set up a perimeter and so you kind of send your men out into the darkness. And it's interesting because. Even though there's nothing you can really do about it, if you arrive at the spot at night time, mm. then it's night time and you get there and you have to throw flares and magnesium and stuff like that outside so you can see anything. Mm. Um, but if it's daytime, you still like you just you are going out into the unknown, and every time that's always exciting. Um, whereas the, you've also got the world view, which is where you kind of manage your global response to UFOs so you will shoot UFOs down and you will research things and you will sell items and kind of try and keep the budget going because you're not just a fighting force you're also like basically a governmental body and so you've got a budget to adhere to and you need to try and find ways to get accommodations to that budget and if you if you decide that month you're going to like focus on something else and you're not going to like look after say Japan they're going to lower your funding as a result of that so it's interesting how well those two parts of the game mesh together because they're they're totally separate like you're basically you're playing like I don't know anti UFO agency tycoon in one and then you're playing a turn based battle game in the other one but they link together mm. and I think that's nice each like each game like they like we've we've kind of been joking about x hyphen calm and x calm <laughs> and all that there but it's true like not just in terms of name and and branding but like both games do have come with each creator's, you know, style and signature and their own stamp on it. Like, like I was, um, I don't know if you've watched it, but like, um, there was this hour, near hour long interview uh, released last, either done last year or two years ago, and it had um, Julian Gollop uh, representing the old XCOM, X hyphen com, and Jake Solomon on um, XCOM, like just talking with each other. And Solomon's like said in the past, like the old X hyphen coms like is his favorite game. So like, um, like talk talk of that unique style that they both bring to their games. Like and like, is there any, is there any way that I'm trying to figure out how to pra- phrase this question? But basically, is there anything in their own each their each respective game that they could bring over to the other game? Basically, something to bring over from Gollop's XCOM to Solomon's XCOM. And then Solomon's XCOM to Gollop's XCOM. 
Yeah, I mean, obviously X hyphen com is my favourite game, so I think it's perfect and shouldn't ever be touched. Um, but if I was going to add anything, um, the one thing that works really well in the new X com that I really like is I like the cover system. Mm. Um, it, that's that's because the new X com is a cover shooter ultimately, um, mm. <laughs> which is why you can't shoot, you can't free fire like you can in the original. Mm. Um, so in the original, for example, all of the maps are fully destructible, same as they are here. Mm. Um, and I guess that's what I would bring over back to uh, back to the new XCOM is I'd make the maps fully destructible and I'd make it so that you could fire whenever you want because it's quite nice. Um, if you want to get an advantage on an alien, you know he's in a building, you just blow the side of the wall down with uh, laser fire and just storm the side of the building from that way. It's nice because there's always tactical options. Mm. Like what? What about? Um... Would you bring something over from Gollop's XCOM over the Solomon's XCOM? That's not quite an enemy within. Yeah, I mean that's that's it. It would be the uh, it would be the being able to free fire. Ah, uh, okay, okay. All right. Um, that's not. I don't know. I I don't actually. There's a lot of systems that I kind of because they're, they're very different games, and I feel like by bringing like it wouldn't really work to bring stuff over. I mean they're clearly like. Well, this, this is like a dream, like a dream fantasy scenario, basically, like. So to speak. So, like, like, well, like, what, what systems would you see? Yeah, I mean, I'd love to see like a proper inventory mm. back in the new one because there's not an inventory at all. It's just kind of a series of things. So it's like, um, if if you run out of ammo um, in the original XCOM, then you go and find one of your dead buddies who has ammo and you scavenge it off his corpse. And m- moments like that are nice. Um, like from a gameplay point of view mechanically they're very interesting and I feel like in trying to streamline the experience the new XCOM hasn't really captured a lot of that Gollop in that, in that same interview I referenced like Gollop said he wanted to make a game where the player was coming up against you know intelligent life force like the aliens and all that there And but he also said that events in the game were never predefined they were never predetermined they were random encounters like this this was essentially a game where Anything could happen at any given time. Yeah, I mean, it's... um. So basically, the way that it works is that the AI were given missions, so every spaceship had a mission. Mm-hmm. And later in the game, you can unlock... You can build a base facility which will tell you what that mission is. Um, but even before that, they're still doing things. So, for example, these aliens could be scouting, or these aliens could be looking for your base, or, you know, aliens could be looking for your interceptors to get vengeance for something that's been shot down, or they could be going to a terror mission to, to you know, antagonize a town. And later on in the game, when you start seeing that, you can start using these patterns, and it's kind of like looking behind the curtain. But the first time you're playing, and before you know you can do that, it seems like they're intelligent, because everyone, everyone seems to have a purpose. Hmm. All of these spaceships flying around are doing so for a reason. He, Gallup said as well, like, um, like he wanted to set it on Earth because of an emotional attachment, like we all, like, subconsciously we had. I don't, I don't know what he meant by that, but hmm, worth noting that. Or I thought it was worth interesting, like it was worth no- pointing that out. But me- yeah, well, I mean, if you look at, if you look at the, there's basically some remakes to UFO Afterbirth games, right? Mm, yeah. Um, and they're all set, well, that like they're set on Mars. Ah, that's right. Yeah. And it's meh. Basically, like, yeah, uh, and I, I think that's because partially because they're quite bad games. <laughs> but alongside that, being slightly more charitable, I think they just don't have the same emotional punch because, yeah, that's set on Earth. Like, you are actively defending. So, like, you go to Los Angeles and you'll be desperately trying to save people as they're running around the streets. And it's not exactly that same feeling when you know you've never actually been on a planet that you've never been on in your entire life. Yeah, I mean, also. It's recognisable, so like we all know what LA is like. Mm. If you, you know, we've either been there or we've seen it on TV or in a movie. And while they, well, the 1994 PC game definitely didn't capture what LA was like, your brain can kind of fill the blanks in a little bit, you know? Mm, absolutely. Um, like you mentioned those kind of fan remakes, like like uh, UFO. Um, like, um, like. There was a few others, I think, as well, if I remember correctly, right? Yeah, um, I mean, the one that I the one that I play now, actually, the one that I would see as like a true successor and play it as much as I do the original, if not more, now, um, is Xenonauts, which was the Chris England uh, remake. Hmm. That was that was kickstarted and was like a fully professional product. Hmm. Like, like talk about about that. Like, how, like how does that 
refined from the original, so to speak. Um, Xenonauts is basically what I would have wanted to see from an XCOM remake. Mm. Um, so it takes a lot of the problems with the original game, because there were problems, obviously. Like, it was made in 94, there was a lot of stuff they couldn't do then. Um, it takes a lot of the problems and it refines them. So, for example, a lot of people that have played XCOM for a long time feel like giving your soldiers mind control unbalances the game. And it does. Um, so, in this one, Chris England was like, oh, okay, well, we're just not going to... We're just not going to have mind powers for, for your troops then. That's fine. And there's things like you can give your you can give your soldiers inventories that suit them hmm. rather than rather than it just being randomly assigned. And you can also give them spots. So, for example, you can give guys shotguns and you can put them at the entrance ramp so that every time you land, every single time, those two soldiers are the guys that are at the ramp ready to go down. Um, because you don't get all of that stuff in the original. Hmm. So it's it's nice. It, it refines a lot of things and it makes it more interesting. And it Actually, it gives it a really nice... There's a really nice Cold War flavour to it as well, like just to make it slightly different. But, I mean, there's no... There's no two ways about it. It's definitely an XCOM remake in every way, shape, or form, as faithful as possible to the original game. For the for, certainly for the original, anyways. Like, um, like there was plenty of f- fan created content. I don't know, certainly, like there was fan made patches and all out there. Like, go into that a little bit. Yeah, um, there's a couple of patches which. So there's this thing called XCOM Utility, which I use, which enables you to kind of fiddle with some things. So there's um, there, there used to be a couple of glitches with the home base. Um, that were never fixed, and so XCOM Utility will fix those. Um, it's I don't know. I, I've never played much of the mods, although there was also a really cool mod that I enjoyed that made the game two-player, and so the other people could play as the aliens. Yeah. And so the aliens were having an escalating campaign yeah. against the humans, and that's really interesting to play versus. All the XCOM, oh, sorry, not the old XCOM, the new XCOM. Like, does that have multiplayer at all? I can't remember. Yeah, no XCOM's got a multiplayer, but it's just a versus mode. Ah, uh, okay. No, it doesn't work very well. You just give all the, you give all your soldiers ally cannons, and then they win. Ah, uh, okay. Well, I, I didn't touch multiplayer like on XCOM, so I, I can be forgiven for that kind of uh, forgetfulness. Um, but like, like what what like that kind of PvP? What was that kind of PvP experience like for the the, the mod for the old one? Yeah, um, it's interesting. Um, there's because it's not it's not balanced for that. It's not designed to be played like that. Oh. Uh, playing an alien menace, which is literally an alien, like is is actually intelligent. It's terrifying. Like in what way? Yeah, I mean it's so you're you're playing against someone who's smart. So rather than the AI behavior, which is predictable, and it's something that you can abuse, you've got someone who is actually like so they will send a terror mission to one side of the globe, and you will respond to that, and then they will kind of go and do whatever they need to do on the other side of the globe while your back's turned, because you can only be in a couple of places at once. Um, now the AI obviously is slightly predictable, so you you understand when that stuff's going to happen. But when you're playing against another human being in a strategy game, obviously there's always going to be the chance that they can upset you. There was a few other XCOM games that uh, came after um, uh, UFO. So, like, there was Terror from the Deep, Apocalypse, and Interceptor. And those were the games that we'll, we'll focus on from Microprocessor because those were the last ones before Hasbro came in. Um, so, yeah, just just talk a bit about uh, those. Terror from the Deep first. Yeah, well, Terror from the Deep was basically the first game, but uh, harder. That was it. There was it was built in the same engine. It was basically the same. Um, in terms of lore, it took its cues from Lovecraft a lot more, mm. or at least that was, you know, like it, there were there were some Lovecraftian elements. Um, it also brought lobster men, which were a fucker. Is the only way to describe it. Um, so lobster men could take like two magazines of ammunition mm. from a troop and just keep running towards them, and if they reached you, you were dead. Um, I saw people lobbing like. Backpacks full of grenades at lobster men, and they just survive it. Um, like they, they were solid. And Terror from the Deep also brought things like cruise ships that you could, like, that you had to clear out and all of that stuff. It's it's quite exciting, but it's not quite as good as the original. Um, Apocalypse is actually really good. Um, everyone, Apocalypse is kind of like XCOM Marmite. Um, so I really liked it because it's basically based in one city. And so, like, residents will call in and be like, hey, there are aliens in our block, and you can respond to that. But 
you also there's also like fifty different uh, there's also like fifty different corporations in in the city, and you've got a reputation with all of them, and everything that you order has to actually make it to you through the city, and so so imagine you need a armor right, and the armor company don't don't like you because you blew because like last time you went and tried to help them get aliens out of their factory you blew loads of the machinery up so they make the armor more expensive so you have to save longer to get the armor get the armor from them then you buy the armor and they're shipping the armor to you along the road and then aliens attack the city Hmm. and so you're shooting aliens down and like an alien crashes and that causes a traffic jam which means that your armor is now stuck in traffic and it's going to take longer to get to you. Like, it's an incredibly ambitious game. Um, and also, if you decide that you really want something and you're just going to take it, you can also just assault any building you want. Hmm. So you can rob the armor guys if you wanted to and then take it back. Obviously, there'd be, like, a response and maybe they'd send the army after you. Like, it's it's an incredibly ambitious game and it also brought in, like, real-time and turn, turn-based uh, strategy. Um, it's it's kind of a flawed gem and it's very difficult to play mm. I think especially now but it's there's a lot of interesting ideas there and it's a real shame that they didn't get to continue with the games that they were making what about um, Interceptor? Um, I haven't played Interceptor it doesn't work very well on new machines and I didn't get it at the time oh ok 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 that's fair enough I think that actually Apocalypse might have been Gulp's last game no looking back so. So, um, yeah, Apocalypse was perhaps a good place to stop there. Um, so, like, let, let's talk in a bit more detail then about the more recent XCOM, the one without the hyphen. Um, like, that was a bit of a surprise, like, considering at the time 2K were making two XCOM games. The shooter and, like, a, a strategy-driven, you know, uh, old, old day to the good old days, let's say. Um, when 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 that was first announced, especially when XCOM, the 2K Marin XCOM shooter was was like there was a lot going on with that in development because like that went from a first person shooter from Jordan Thomas, uh, who did Bioshock 2, and then becoming a third person shooter, or rather a first person shooter to then become a strategic first person shooter to then become a third person shooter. To, de- uh, to become a strategic for a third person shooter, I mean, so, um, but we're not talking about the shooters. We're we're talking about uh, for X, X, XCOM. So yeah, like, like what 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 were your initial thoughts when that was announced, and like, uh, and when the game came out, what, what did you think afterwards? Yeah, um, I mean, I liked it. I I don't think it's as good, not at all, but um, I think it's definitely interesting. Hmm. Like, 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 what, what were the ways that you find find the game interesting? Yeah, well, <laughs> well, it's it's a reinvention of the original, so obviously I'm going to give it a go from there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it is interesting the way that your soldiers here are kind of individual agents, and they've got they've got their own stats and they've got skills, and so the way that you use them is vastly different. So in XCOM, obviously, everyone is basically everyone's like a round peg to go in a round hole. Um, whereas with the new XCOM, you know, you've got triangular pegs and square pegs and you need to use them to the best of your ability. And I find that alters things. Also, the fact that there's only four and then later six people is ridiculous. Um, like, what 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 about the expansion Enemy Within? Because, like, I've actually not played Enemy Within at all, although I think I may have it from PS Plus for the PS3, or maybe that's just the vanilla uh, enemy unknown, but yeah, like, like, did you play Enemy Within at all? Yeah, Enemy Within is quite good. Um, I haven't finished the campaign as I lost interest, but uh, it adds a lot of cool things. Also, mechs are great fun, and it's nice to be able to punch berserkers in the face. Go, like, touching on a br- uh, brief about then on XCOM too. Like, it does seem like they're going to be, you know, um, improving on a lot of things, like from the first game. I uh, mean, it, it looks like it's going to be very different. I mean, I wrote some stuff about XCOM 2 previously, and I really feel like, yeah, it's it's a good sequel, but I am a little nervous about how it's going to go. I mean, it's uh, like it you are you're no long like the aliens and I do occupying force, and now you're kind of fighting. It's like a guerrilla fight, and so I'm not a hundred percent sure how I feel about it, but it does seem to be moving 
at least in part, it seems to be moving a lot more towards its strategy routes, mm. and I'm really big on that. Mm. Um, for like for me personally speaking, it's a shame that it's not going to be on consoles because, like I said uh, earlier in the show, like I played a lot, I spent a lot of my time playing the um, the first for XCOM on PC, but. My my PC is kind of fubar now. Like it won't play games. I can do everything else, obviously. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing this. But it it won't play games. Otherwise, the hard drive will just drop. And the old hard drive I have is not that great in terms of storage. So I try to keep it off that. But um, the one thing that really grates me about it is that there's not going to be a new console version as a result. Because like I've I've I don't know how many console RP, um strategy games you've played, but like I. Really, re- the, there's one or two that really stick out for me, and one of them is Halo Wars. Yeah. And, um, and I was very excited to see that being announced. But like, at least that's also coming to PC as well, like coming to a platform that's never been on, or at least in that series and that sub series. And I was like, uh, when, perhaps it should have. But like with XCOM, XCOM Two, and I was like. It's it's a shame that they're not seeing it on console because like I know a few people who actually played it on console first time round. Um, but at the same time, obviously the PC is the natural home. But I would assume that at least down the line they would have come to consoles. But they've said it's not coming to console at all. So yeah, well, I mean that's it's so different. I reckon there's a lot of stuff under the hood there. I mean, like all the procedural generation and the concealment and things like that are very exciting. Hmm. <laughs> It's, it's, like I, I mean, it's it's okay for games not to come to console. No, 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 absolutely. Like, and like, I'm sure the same is true for PC and all that there. But like, it's, mm, I, it's just I really want to keep up with the series now, and it's kind of hard not to. Keep, it's hard to keep up now that there won't be a console version, and I can't play as much on PC. But say la vie, I, I think I should just get my PC fixed. Anyways, um. Top three XCOM games. What would they be? Obviously, um, X hyphen com would be at the top. But how well, how would you fill out the rest of the top three? Yeah. Um. I mean, I'd probably put Xenonauts second mm. in the series, but it's basically supposed. You know, it is a spiritual remake. I feel like it's closer to the experience I enjoyed in the others. And then X hyphen com or X no hyphen com. Um, uh, as third. Honourable mentions, go for it. So, uh, I've mentioned Jagged Alliance 2, I won't say more about it, but that's definitely up there. Um, DSX is something that I have a lot of time for and spent a lot of time growing up playing. Um, What I really like about DSX is that it takes a lot of the RPG features, so you get cool things like locational damage. Um, The really nice thing about DSX, for example, is if you put a landmine at like leg height and an enemy walks past it, it'll blow his legs off and he won't be able to run away. Hmm. And that sort of thing happens to you as well. So you can have your legs blown off, and then you can't run. You have to crawl. Um, And I think that's kind of interesting, and there's a lot of different things in this game. I basically like mechanics-heavy stuff. Um, And then obviously there's Rainbow Six as well, which I'm quite a fan of. He is, he is. A a little bit of a fan. Um, And I guess I like that because it's... It's very. It is uh, basically the most tactical of shooters. You have to really think about every bullet that you're firing, and I like that because it makes you scared. Pulling the trigger, violence, which is fun because the game is basically just dishing out violence. I think, I think Rainbow Six is definitely my favourite shooter, but if I could bring an entire genre into uh, into honourable mentions, it would definitely be shooters, which is primarily what I play. Your your love for um, Rainbow Six, like, if if I had to poke you, like, <laughs> like uh, if I had to poke you to talk a little more about how much you love X, ah, sorry, not XCOM, because we've already done that, like, with Rainbow Six, like, how, how, how far are you willing to talk of your love for Rainbow Six? Yeah, um, Rainbow Six, not even really when I played it, 
like I mean I remember playing it and it was okay um but I think what really happened uh I think when I really got into it was probably about 2001 2002 four or five years after it came out mm. is I was playing on PC and I just I really I really got into it I really love um I'd put SWAT on a similar pedestal um, it's just that I feel like Rainbow Six did it first, and so I should always give it the uh, the credit. Um, like I really liked that there was a plan, and you had schematics, and you had tons of information, and it was like, look, this is the mission. You need to make this mission happen. Here are your options. Here are the pool of guys to make it happen. Like, make this work. And I, I, I really like that. So... I like Metal Gear Solid 5, for example, because it gives you a whole lot of information and a lot of ways to make it happen. I've always enjoyed games like that. Like, um, it's it's nice to play as a professional, doing a professional thing. Mm. If that if that makes any sense, yeah. like, so Rainbow Six is nice because this is just like normal stuff for this guys. It's like, hey, cool. So I need you to. Uh, I need you to raid this embassy and bring these guys out alive. And they're like, yeah, cool, I got that. Mm. Um, it makes you feel good. It And it's it's just better than things like... I mean, in 1998, also, like, Half-Life came out. Mm. And Unreal came out. And they're both fine games, but they're shooting games, you know? Like, um, Rainbow Six is not a shooting game so much as it is a thinking game. You need to think about who you're shooting. <laughs> it's it's sort of a strategy game with embedded within a first person shooter essentially. Yeah, and I guess I guess potentially that's probably getting to the getting to the uh, the base of everything that I enjoy about games. Is that I need an element of strategy there. I need I need systems that are doing exciting things for my brain to interface with. Mm. Hmm. Um so like what about the like the rest like going forwards in the fu- uh, in the future in terms of the series like i my my first foray in the series was i think a demo of rainbow six free but my first proper foray for the series was rainbow six vegas i really enjoyed vegas not vegas 2 not so much um i mean i, I as a rainbow six purist i think vegas is terrible um, I've enjoyed it. Um, I've played through the campaigns of Rainbow Six and Rainbow Six Vegas. Um, yeah, Rainbow Six Vegas 1 and 2 I've finished. I've played hundreds of hours of the multiplayer on both. Mm. And I've already I've already got a copy of uh, Siege. Mm. Well, like, I, I have paid for a copy of Siege. Ah. Um, like, and I'm sure I'll enjoy that as well. But I really... I think after Rainbow Six 3, they really went downhill. Like I've given, I've given multiple talks about Rainbow Six series going downhill, but basically, yeah, they did free, and then from there they just got increasingly kind of like console games, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. But in the era when it came out, so Rainbow Six Lockdown, which was the first of the bad ones, was on the Xbox, and they basically just tried to turn it into a corridor shooter, and they gave you like a main character, and there was a big overarching plot rather than the mission-based structure, and I don't know, I guess I find it hard to buy into that, because it took away everything that I really enjoyed about the original, Mm. and just replaced it with kind of meh. Mm. Although Siege seems to be a bit more old school. Yeah, um, Siege's terrorist hunt mode sounds fantastic. Um, I haven't had a chance to play it, and I won't get a chance to play it till the beta comes out mm. um, next week, week after. Mm, I think it's the week after, yeah. Yeah, at which point that's all I'll play forever. <laughs> uh, it's the week before I go to New York, so uh, I'm really glad, because if it had been a week later, I probably would have not gone to New York. <laughs> <laughs> um... Do you have uh, any more animal merchants? Yeah, um, just having a think. Sorry, there's so, so, so many games that I play a lot of. Um, Company Heroes, actually. It's a very big one. Company Heroes and Men of War, both big strategy games, World War II. Um, Company Heroes is nice because it takes World War II strategy and makes it accept- accessible for everyone. Mm. Uh, and I really like a lot of the cool abilities you get. Men of War is really good because it takes World War II strategy, makes it incredibly granular and incredibly painful to play, um, which seems annoying. But when you get when you manage to sneak like one SAS member past a load of Russians, 
and he just manages to kill like 50, 60 people because he's in a good position and he's well trained. Like, nothing beats that. Mm. The multiplayer of Man of War is the best RTS multiplayer I've ever played. Metal Gear Solid 1 is obviously worth mentioning. Um, it's the game that introduced me to stealth, so that's really nice. In a similar vein, Siphon Filter, because that was the game that introduced me to killing a whole load of people in the name of stealth. Um, which is the best kind of stealth. Top three games ever, what would they be? Obviously, X hyphen com at the top, but like, what would you yeah, feel um, second and third? X hyphen com, Jagged Alliance. Uh, I'd probably put Rainbow Six in there as well. Like, what, like the original Rainbow Six? Um, it's scandalous, but I'd probably put Rainbow Six 3 in because Rainbow Six 1 hasn't aged very well because it's a first person shooting game from 1998, you know, like. Uh, FPS games um, really, really struggle with engine changes. You can find me on Twitter underscore Jake Tucker. Um, you can hire me because I'm a freelance writer and it works. Um, or you can check out Video Brains and maybe come to an event at videobrains.co.uk. Thanks for listening to my favourite game. We're taking a two week break off now, but when we come back in a few weeks, it'll be with Carly Veloci on Silent Hill 2. Until then, enjoy Fallout 4. Bye bye!